once again, thanks, Adam, for the introduction. Um, so without much delay, let me get into this new library, Zio Constrainless. Uh, that's in our Zio ecosystem. Uh, Zio Constrainless allows you to write programs using abstractions without worrying about type classes and executor level details. I know that's really an abstract statement, so let me get into a proper example. This is still a very toy example. We will get into a bit more realistic example uh, down the line. So let's get into this um, expression DSL. This is a simple example, which you can um, sort of reason about in terms of the usability of uh, ADTs and generalized ADTs and um, typically initial encoding. No, we're not getting into the details of or, or the use of those type of techniques, but rather we will get into the details of one of the problems of using some of those techniques. Expression DSL, as you can see here, it has got an int expert, double expert, a sum of two expressions having the same type, a zip node, which typically uh, used in many, many DSLs now. Uh, in this case, it's uh, it's taking a left expression of type A and right expression of type B and uh, make it into a product or a tuple. And the usage of that expression is pretty straightforward. The sum of two primitives, sum of one and two, and then a complex expression, which is uh, sum of two products. And here you can see the sum of two products returns you a product itself. It just adds left and right uh, of both these tuple. That's pretty straightforward. And we need to compile this, uh, this language now. Um, so given an expression, need to pattern match on every node in the expression tree and then return the type. So the compilation here is expression of A to A. So if the expression of A is index per, the only way that can happen is if A is an integer. Similarly, it is a double expression only if A is a double. So you can return int and double, and this is going to be satisfied by the compiler. But how about sum of two expressions? Obviously you need to compile the left and compile the right, and that those return A, A type A, and then you have no more capabilities on top of A to use a plus because it's just an A. Um, and that makes sense too, because this left could be compiled down to a primitive or the left could be compiled down to a product. So we need to know how to add a product or how to add a primitive, add two primitives, or in fact, it could be nested products a nested tuple. And this is a very small problem, which can get super confusing when it comes to a larger language for your application code, for instance. Um, there goes type class. So you got some type A and you need to inject a capability on that polymorphic A. And the typical way of doing that is bringing type class. So I brought num type class that has an add function, takes a left A and right A and adds them. Um, so I have instance for int, double, and you can derive one for tuple. And we use that type class in the compiler with the hope that we could use that in the sum node. Well, it works for certain cases, although many of you might have already found it's conceptually wrong because you might be passing an expression of a tuple. So the evidence here is a, a num of a tuple. It's if you pass an expression of a product, the type class instance that is in scope is that of a product. And this works if, if it was a sum of a zip node, right? So because left is a zip and right is a zip, it compiles down to a, 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 a tuple, and then you can use the evidence of tuple addition. But if it was a zip of a sum of primitives, then left is a primitive and right is a primitive, but all the only evidence that you have here is evidence of a product. And interestingly, not much interestingly, because you can see we are, we are doing some sort of hack with as instance of to satisfy the compiler. 
Uh, but oftentimes we see this um, see this pattern where execution logic has got this runtime casting. In, in this case, the first one will work, compile and work, and the second one will just have uh, runtime exception. So how about constraints at the point of definition, right? So we were trying to use type class instance at the point of execution. We tried and that didn't work quite nicely. So let's try and propagate the type class definition, type class instance at the point of definition of the, of the abstraction. Simply means at the sum node, I make sure that there is an evidence of num type class. So you can use this sum node for adding two expressions, given that A has an instance of num type class. Um, and that actually works. It solves the problem. Um, you can make use of that evidence by calling sum dot evidence and add compile left and compile right, everything good. But that's completely against software principles. Um, the language now knows the executor detail, in this case, none. Um, and by going against the principle, the, the after effect is what happens if the executor need more capabilities? For example, your executor needs a SQL decoder or a JSON decoder or a num type class or a show instance to pretty print and, um, and whatnot. Like it keeps getting complicated. In any business logic, the executor keeps getting complicated and you need to propagate that information at every point of definition in the language. And sometimes you don't need a type class at all, right? So even if you define the type class instance constraint at the point of definition of the case class, you may not need that for the executor. So here is an executor which simply pretty prints an expression language. Maybe it is pretty printing to a JSON or maybe a, a, another abstract syntax tree which some other language can parse it and compile it in their way, like, like a C language. Um, and we call it as an optimized executor. So now your optimized executor don't have, or don't need a type class instance at all, but your non-optimized um, executor will need a type class instance. But you got the point here, right? Type classes is part of the execution, not part of the language. Now this goes back to, and strainless and the idea, which is taken up from a Haskell paper. Uh, the link is here. And the key principle that underpins the idea, this is just taken from the paper, is implementation specific constraints should be imposed at the point of use of data type, not at the point of definition. It simply goes back to the basic principle of the abstraction should never know any details about implementation. So your constrainless allows you to solve this problem um, such that you don't need to talk anything about the specific type class at the point of definition. And then you can also use multiple type classes at the point of execution. We will see how it is done. And the idea of implementing CO constrainless is taken from uh, this particular Haskell paper. The core idea is we need all the types existing in the program tree to have an instance of a type class. So your program can generate any type of types uh, depending on how you compose the program. And that type should need a type class instance. It should be able to look up from somewhere this instance and use it. And CO constraint list gives you something called as instances. It's got two type holes. This is an example of an instances. And AS is a list of types represented as AS type list, a subclass of type list. Type list comes from zero constraint list library. So this simply means every type in that list has an instance of num. So instances of num AS simply represents every type in the list of AS has an instance of num. That's all what we need, but let's see how this is being used. Um, so again, code intense slides is going to come. Um, before that, the, the basic assumption here is your program 
you must be knowing all the possible types that your program may generate. Um, and that's actually valid in many, many use cases. After trying out at my client places, um, obviously as a prototype, um, and in my toy examples, um, as I build this library, I felt that the, this idea is not, uh, not too difficult to uh, satisfy. Um, for example, you can assume that your application is going to read only 50 columns from the database, and all of the fields should be a primitive, say integer, double, and string, and it cannot read any other complex types. You can represent that. That's the allowed type of your application. So if someone is trying to read something else, it's going to give a compile time error. So let's redefine our expression language. Um, this pattern is going to stay the same regardless of the type of DSL you build. So this is how this is the only way to use your constraint list that propagate the information of type list. So have one more type parameter, call it AS. That's the subclass of type list. We'll see how this is being used. This means you need to satisfy the compiler. So you need to keep propagating across all the terms in the ADT. And then interestingly, some node will have um, will have an extra evidence that if you are using some node, then that A should be an element of that type list. So A is an element of A's. <clears throat> this will be automatically provided by CEO constraint list, but you need to provide this information in the DSL. And here is an example of allowed types. And this is more or less like an H list. Um, um, and it's it's within uh, CEO constraint list. Um, so he, this is simple, right? It's it, it should support int double, int int, int double, int. That's it. Um, with Scala 3, it, it's much more easier. You can use union types and then say, okay, my primitive is integer or double, and then say, uh, okay, my allowed types can be one element or two elements or three elements, like or like I said, 50 columns, 50 elements. So replacing int, int expert and double expert with primitive. So with Scala 3, you don't need uh, int expert and double expert separately, but that's just a detail. We don't need to worry too much about it. Um, this is a third way of uh, defining allowed types, um, which makes it much more generic. But regardless, we got the idea. We need to define an allowed type. Um, and, and this is the original program back again. Like it's adding two primitives and then adding two products. Now we need to compile it. So how do we use this? At the compilation phase, you provide something called as instances of NumAS. This is something that I already explained. So compilation says at any point in your program tree, you must be having a type that is in this list. And then there is a second evidence that Every element of that list has an instance of now. That's all that we need. And then it's all about satisfying the compiler. So in this case, when you hit some node, you're basically looking up the exact type class from this collection. This is sort of like a collection. And then use that to add two numbers. And this entire piece of code is simply satisfying the compiler. This is instance has got a function called as with instance. And with instance uh, says that, hey, if you have got a type plus instance, you need to add, um, you need to add them. Give me a second. I'm getting any messages? No. Sorry. Um, just to say if I have any audio issues. Um, another example is query DSL. So query DSL is, um, is another practical example which I encountered. Um, this is simply um, representing a program, trying to read database, trying to read cache, trying to read an API, and then it has got a flat map. Um, so for example, you're trying to get an ID from, from an API, 
through an API request. And then you use that ID to fetch the person detail from SQL. And then based on the person detail, you may need to get uh, some other information from the SQL. So at any point in your program, the decoder keeps changing. And it's better try not to make, make your executor concrete with the types because then your executor and the DSL is tied to just one implementation. Tomorrow, if we if they need an actual execution plan instead of an execution beat, execution result, it's very hard because you have only one executor, right? Because it's not polymorphic. So as soon as you make your executor polymorphic, you will need something like zero constrainless. Otherwise, you need to make a lot of assumptions in, in your brain and do sort of basically runtime casting in your executor. So here is an executor, uh, executor we call compiler. And I have an instances of SQL decoder. I have an instances of JSON decoder at various points in the program. I can safely look up those type classes and simply use them. And I can use the same DSL to form an execution plan or to, to pretty print the entire thing, making things highly observable. And this is what CO Constrainless provides. So as a summary, we have a program that's completely independent of type classes. And however, the program talks about something called as type list. And every possible types within the program should be element of that list. And at the compiler, we can look up those type classes for any of the types that existing in your code, in your executor from instances uh, that's coming from CO constraint list. And it's good to invest some time on, uh, on this pattern because it allows you to write very flexible, uh, observable and optimizable DSL. Um, so you, you, your DSL can, can be transformed. Like for example, you have an execution plan of query to an execution plan of string, which you can pretty print um, and then uh, have it as part of an endpoint so that developers can debug. In fact, we are using that pattern in, in one of our client places. And most importantly, it will allows you to write. It will allow you to write a highly type safe executor, and bring complete orthogonality. And John was really talking about CO schema. CO schema uses CO constrainless internally. And generally, what I found was application that needs to be backed or complex applications that needs to be highly observable can uh, benefit from this library. That's about it. Thank you, everyone.